but just know that clipping, you know, there's a proper relationship. Some clipping is okay. Too much clipping means the system just wasn't designed properly. And for those of you who may not even be familiar with, with the terms that we're using, let me just take a step back and explain the basics of, of why clipping is an issue with solar systems. And so you're exactly right, Joe. We might lose a little bit in the summer months, but frankly, everywhere will produce phenomenally in the summer months. The area for you to really have your system work best for you annualized is outside of summer months. <laughs> Now, one other thing that uh, we talked about, Dan, and I'd like to touch on a little bit too for the audience is the question of the proper pairing of solar panels to microinverters. Because, you know, like in any competitive situation, right, you have different things that the competitors will, will hit each other on. And so typically, Enphase will hit Solar Edge, Solar Edge being the, the, the market leading central inverter manufacturer for residential. So Enphase will hit Solar Edge with our system is more resilient. There's no central point of failure, and and that's to to the most extent true. There, there's no central inverter point of failure. Uh, Solar Edge will hit Enphase with well, there's too much clipping loss, right? And so what clipping loss means is you have a solar panel, let's say that's rated at at 400 watts for ideal lab conditions, but you have it connected to a microinverter that's rated for 300 watts. 300 watts max output, or maybe 330 watts if you go one model up. So why is there that discrepancy between a 400 watt panel and, and a 330 watt microinverter? That's potential, potential clipping, right? Dan, do you get this question often? Yeah, it's, it's so guys, just so you know, too, this is definitely going to be the more advanced question, right? Sometimes depending on your process of selling or how you generate your opportunities, some of these questions are way above people's knowledge base. And frankly, some people, again, don't want to know the answer. But let's just kind of preface the fact that we're having a conversation that is more technical today. So we're going to really get into this. Um, I do get that question from time to time from somebody that's more researched and understands some of the principles. And the reality of it is, too, guys, is that clipping isn't always isn't a bad thing. Sometimes we do and you're going to experience clipping, particularly in the core summer months. If a system is designed right and the inverter is selected properly, you're going to see some clipping in the summer when solar production is most optimal. And that clipping is by design because in the fall, winters, and spring, when solar production isn't as optimal, the clipping that you experience in the summer will end up having a more impactful benefit in the later part of the year because of the, the relationship between the solar panel sizing and the inverter sizing is more optimum. So just know that clipping can happen. I, I guess the basic way to describe clipping to a lot of people too is the inverter has now reached a maximum production threshold and any performance that the solar panel could have possibly still you know, created, you're no longer going to be able to capture. And so you've clipped, you've maxed out at whatever that that relationship may be. And we'll get into a little bit of the technicals here as to how that gets sized. It has a lot to do with the wattage of the panel, the, you know, the the wattage or volt amp ratings as well of the the inverters. Um, but just know that clipping, you know, there's a proper relationship. Some clipping is okay. Too much clipping means the system just wasn't designed properly. Exactly, exactly. And, and for those of you who may not even be familiar with, with the terms that we're using, let me just take a step back and explain the basics of, of why clipping is an issue with solar systems. All right. I hope you're getting some great value from today's video content. If you're a solar sales professional out there, or maybe you're considering starting a career in solar sales coming in from another industry, then I'd like to invite you to Solar Surge University. Solar Surge University is the premier online training program for aspiring solar sales professionals who, who really want to be professionals. Learn how to sell solar at an expert level with a consultative approach. It's the same approach that I use and that we use here at Solar Surge to do over $700,000 a month in solar sales virtually with no advertising budget. So if you'd like to separate yourself from the pack of undereducated, underperforming solar salespeople, check out Solar Surge University, where you can learn all of our expert techniques and for a limited time, have access to my live sales call recordings with some of my live clients. So again, we invite you to check out Solar Surge University. The link will be below here. And we're also offering a 14 day, no risk money back guarantee. 
So all solar power systems, all solar panels and solar cells are natively a, a direct current electrical device. They're, they're DC direct current, which means constant voltage. If you have a 12 volt battery in your car, it's always a 12 volt difference between the positive and the negative terminal or you know, right in a tight range there. Our homes and, and the electric grids are wired for alternating current. And so with alternating current, the, the voltage actually oscillates in a sine wave uh, up and down, up and down, reversing polarity uh, here in the U.S. At, at a frequency of 60 cycles per second. So you actually have the voltage kind of reversing uh, direction 60 times per second. But the average voltage or what we call the RMS voltage is 240 volts for a, a U.S. residential home service. Or if you take half of that with one leg, you get 120 volts. And that's why we have 120 volts uh, on our outlets. But every solar power system that's hooked up to power your home or to send power to the electric grid has to have inversion, right? There has to be an inversion, which is converting DC electricity, could be coming from solar cells, could be coming from batteries, into alternating current electricity, which is actually usable by the circuits and the appliances in our home and actually exportable out to the power company, right? It's got to match, the, 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 the electricity has got to kind of match formats. And so the inverter does that function so when you're looking at the, the power ratings on the system, there's, there's two power ratings to look at. One is, what is the power rating of the DC output of, let's say, the solar panel or the battery? And so if that DC output is fed from the solar panel into a microinverter, then the microinverter itself has a separate power rating, which is how much AC power output can the microinverter actually send out to be used within the house? And so there's oftentimes a, a, a discrepancy. We call it the, the, the DC to AC size ratio um, in, in between those things. And so, Dan, when you, you touched on earlier that it's actually not a bad thing to have a higher DC rating than, an, than the AC rating of your inverter, because overall, the inverter actually works more efficiently if, if it's dealing with power flow that is close to the max, but just not exceeding the max of what its capacity. So you might lose something on the high end, but you also may gain something on the low end because of a more efficient conversion. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And we have to realize as well, guys, I think no matter what market you're in, I mean, even in, in Southern California, Arizona, the markets with very, very high optimum solar productions, we're going to experience, a, typically, if you just look at the quantity of days, you're going to have a larger amount of portion of the year where solar production is not at considered its maximum. Right. So the summer months, almost everywhere in the U.S. are going to produce a phenomenal amount of solar production. It's just the reality of the, the irradiance and the rotation of the earth and et cetera. But in the falls, spring and summer, that's really where the bigger differences can be made up based on what we're referring to here. The way the ratio plays out between your inverter sizing and your solar panel sizing. And so you're exactly right, Joe. We might lose a little bit in the summer months, but frankly, everywhere will produce phenomenally in the summer months. The area for you to really have your system work best for you annualized is outside of summer months, is how, how well do we capture performance in the fall, the winters, and the spring to make a great annualized performance for your system. Right. Let me pull up on the screen here now, because I think this might better illustrate for some of the audience here. I'm pulling up the, the data sheet here from Enphase for their IQ8 microinverter line. And so one of the things that you'll notice here, let me go down to the second page. So one of the things that you notice here is that there's actually several different models of IQ8 microinverters. You've got the base IQ8, you've got the IQ8 Plus, you've got the IQ8M, the IQ8A, and the IQ8H, okay? You also have the IQ8H 208 volt, but this is not something we're going to be really using in a residential system. And so what you'll also see here is that there is a corresponding maximum power output, peak output power for each model. So starting with the IQ8, you have 245 watt limit. On the IQ8 Plus, a 300 watt limit. On the IQ8M, a 330 watt limit. On the IQ8A, it goes up to 366 watts peak power, and the IQ8H, which goes up to 384 watts peak power. Now, again, this is peak output power. It's not how much solar panel input it can take, but this is peak AC output power, usable inverted power that can be used by your home or by, uh, by the electric grid or exported to the electric grid. 
Now, if you go up here, it'll tell you what range, what size range solar modules you could pair with this microinverter. And so you'll notice that the, a microinverter that has an output rating of 384 watts could take input from solar panels rated anywhere from 320 watts all the way up to 540 watts on the DC power rating, right? So you can see there, there's an overload capacity here. Same thing on the IQ8A. This one can take input up to 500 watts on the DC side, even though it's only gonna be putting out 366 watts of usable AC output power. And you'll see the same thing going on down the line here with the other models. And so a question that a lot of folks might ask, you might be asking, your homeowners might be asking, hey, if I have a 400 watt solar panel, don't I have to use the largest microinverter or don't I need to use a larger microinverter? Uh, and the answer in most cases is no, no, not really. And I'm, I'm going to explain why in a little bit. But before I do that, Dan, did you have anything to add on this? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think as we get into that conversation here that you're you were just referencing, that'll be where the greatest value comes in. But yeah, I mean, what we see typically, I can say from a lot of the systems that I've designed and worked on that IQ8 plus to IQ8 M tends to be the area that most average panels in the market today around 400 watts maybe 410, 420s, depending on if you're the size and scope. I mean, that's a separate conversation in and of itself. But that IQ8 Plus and IQ8M ends up being a very common pairing for a lot of the systems that I personally design. Um, but yeah, Joe, let's get into that a little bit more about that 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 whole relationship. Yep. And, and same for me too, by the way. Those are the two models that I use most frequently on my projects. Now I'm going to illustrate why. This is the, the product data sheet for the QCell 400 watt all black panel. This is probably the most popular residential solar panel being sold and being installed across the country right now, the QCell 400. And I wanna show you on their data sheet, some of the electrical characteristics and why we might pair a certain panel with a certain microinverter. So if you notice, their product range also has a, a range of different sort of sub-models that are part of this product line. They, they range from 385 watts on the low end to 405 watts on the high end. Now, this is what we call the STC rating, which stands for Standard Test Conditions, okay? Standard Test Conditions are 1,000 watts per square meter light applied directly perpendicular to the solar cell at 25 degrees Celsius. In other words, this is perfect ideal lab conditions. It's never gonna get any better than this. This is the best thing it can do if everything were perfect in terms of irradiance and the module was kept cool so you, you didn't have any losses because of, of the panel starting to overheat. I think it's important real, and, real quick there too, Joe, I just wanna interject without getting too off topic. Guys, layman's terms here too, this, it will not produce like this in a real world environment. We're just not going to see a 400 watt panel is not going to produce 400 watts because you're not going to see that type of environment. You might get a, a very lucky fortunate day, cool temperatures. It's also something to consider though too. As I mentioned a little earlier, summer performance is going to be great everywhere. But proportionally speaking, you might actually get better performance out of a solar system in the Northeast in the middle of summer than you would out of Phoenix, Arizona, having a lot to do with temperature coefficients and things of that sort can make an, an, an impact there. But I think the main thing just to know here, laboratory, perfect environment scenarios, not real world scenarios. Correct. And, and the solar panel manufacturer is telling you that right here because he's, you know, they're telling you the, the standard test condition rating of this panel is 400 watts. But if you go down here where it says normal operating conditions, that same 400 watt solar panel has a power rating of 300 watts, right? And so normal operating conditions, it's slightly less irradiance because again, in the real world, it's almost never going to be where the sun, the sunlight is directly hitting perpendicular on the solar cells. Usually you're going to have a little bit of an angle, a little bit of reflection because the sun is moving throughout the sky throughout the day. You're also going to have thermal losses, meaning that, you know, you're, you're going to have extreme high temperatures on the rooftop. And the solar panel produces ideally at 25 degrees Celsius is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. But on a summertime on a rooftop here in the, the United States, I mean, you're talking about anywhere's 120 degrees could be upwards of 150 degrees Fahrenheit on the rooftop. And so the efficiency of the solar panel uh, goes down. It's, it's degraded for every degree higher than the ideal temperature. So here Q cells is telling you, yes, our 400 watt solar panel under normal operating conditions is only rated for 300 watts. And so if we go back here 
And when you look at the microinverter that's rated for 300 watts, which is the IQ8 Plus, this is a very common pairing. A 400 watt solar panel, again, 400 watt ideal test condition solar panel, paired with a 300 watt microinverter because the, the actual real world condition rating of that panel is 300 watts. And so pairing it with a 300 watt microinverter is not, you're, you're not, you're not, you know, the customer's not missing out on anything, right? They're not really losing on anything in terms of real world performance. If they are, it's nominal. <laughs>